Hello and welcome to those of us uh, to those of you who are joining us from Zoom and those who are live on Facebook to Dialogue Firesides on December 20th of 2020 with Brian Krasiznik with his remarks today titled Waiting for Jesus. I'm Taylor Petrie conducting today on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board. Other board members include Michael Austin, Chris Kimball, and Rebecca Deschweinitz, who are part of our group today. We're using our webinar format on Zoom and running this live stream on Facebook and are recording this program and we'll post the recording as soon as it is, as it is available on YouTube and our uh, podcast feed. More than 50 years of dialogue content, articles, essays, poetry, and art is available online at dialoguejournal.com and also at JSTOR. These dialogue fireside sessions are posted at the dialogue YouTube channel and our podcast feed. If you're enjoying these sessions, please consider supporting dialogue by subscription or donation. We'll include the dialoguejournal.com address and a number that you can text in the chat. We're excited to host our dialogue fireside with our distinguished speaker tonight. Brian Krasiznik is the youngest of a happy and widely traveled family of sons. His father's work as a petroleum geologist took them to various continents across the globe where his mother unfailingly set up a home filled with music, great food and active conversation furnished with treasures and artifacts from their travels and hosting frequent parties and exotic slideshows of their globetrotting family life. Brian grew up happily dividing his time between his dad's overseas assignments and summers spent with cousins in Rock Springs, Wyoming, a friendly, curious kid with no notion at all of what he wanted to be when he grew up. Though he drew often to entertain himself, it never occurred to him that people actually did that for a living. While based in Utah, Brian is reaching an ever widening audience with his expansion into a national base of collectors and shows, as well as works featured in collections around the world. However widely he wanders, his yearly openings at David Erickson Fine Art in Salt Lake City and Meyer Gallery in Park City always have an air of reunion and camaraderie. His studio practice shifts between monastic solitude in his rural Kenosha studio and, and communal busyness in his Provo studio. When not working in his Kenosha or Provo studio, he lives with his wife, Faith, and their dogs in Salt Lake City. Brian has agreed to hold time for questions and conversation after his remarks. For viewers on Zoom, there's a chat function where you can comment, ask questions, and propose answers. And we ask that you be courteous and thoughtful in the chat. The chat room is also recorded. We will follow the chat room and introduce questions when appropriate, as well as follow the chat and conversation on Facebook as well. Our invocation today will be offered by Edgy Jeter, who goes on lots of walks with his two-year-old and writes computer code for a startup in Lehigh. He's interested in cultural constructions of Mormonism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Our benediction will be offered by Sharon Harris, who is mother to that who, who is mother to that two-year-old, who is the coolest she's ever met, and she's an assistant professor at BYU's English department. She specializes in 17th century English literature and is the author of Enos Jerem Omni, A Brief Theological Introduction, published this summer by the Maxwell Institute. Uh, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Edgy for our invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the many blessings, grateful for all we have been given, grateful for the ability to gather together. We are grateful for light and truth we ask that thou bless us with thy spirit, that we can communicate and understand clearly and be edified. Please bless those who are suffering with strength. Please bless everyone with the ability to help one another. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Brian. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm glad to be here and I'm uh, uh, thankful to... Uh, to uh, Taylor and all of you who have made this, I, well, I hope we're all happy about it afterwards, but, and I'm also glad, uh, Faith has kind of set me up with a, um, a beautiful set here, uh, putting candles in the fireplace and such, and so I wanna appreciate her too. Um, as Taylor said, uh, I wanna talk about waiting for Jesus. And um, uh, the reason I chose that is uh, I think that 
uh, because we're storytellers, human beings are storytellers, uh, there is, a, there is a, an obvious uh, tendency for us to focus on how events culminate and, uh, you know, the, how, how, how they end up at the end of the movie, you know, the, the Luke gets the, what is it, the, uh, yeah, what, what is he shooting into the, the thermal missiles into the Death Star and blows it up, you know, against all odds, you know, that, that w we tell stories that have this kind of a satisfying conclusion. Um, and I think that in, um, in, in church, of course, we do the same sort of thing. Uh, and uh, it, it just has occurred to me that, that a huge part of our lives is spent in the places where those satisfying conclusions uh, have not arrived. Um, and, and so we're kind of, most of us are in the middle of stories. And I want to talk about that, it, you know, and it, it, it obviously at Christmas time, you know, we, we talk about the culminating event of Jesus coming, but there was just such a long time waiting for that to happen. There were lives that people born, believed in it and died and never saw the coming of uh, of a savior and we can you know in a in a short time we can read we can their lives are like footnotes and it was prophesied and then it happened we spend our time thinking about that and and rightly so i mean it's it's a magnificent thing but but part of what i want to talk about is is the uh, well the 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 core of what i what i want to talk about is that what is is that feeling like it's not happening fast enough is probably far more common to the human condition than that my faith has has produced this positive out outcome. Part of faith is believing in something that hasn't yet happened. And so um, I, I wanna talk about a few things from history. I, I also wanna try to not be uh, depressing about this, but but it's a pretty, it's a pretty hard, uh, it's a pretty hard message. And life is, is pretty hard. And I think that um, although, uh, my confidence in God and my trust in God is in a is in a, a a good and positive and redemptive outcome. I think it it is it's helpful for me to learn how to live through the times when the it's not happening the way I planned. It's not happening on the timetable that I that I feel like would be uh, important or necessary. So uh, today I taught Sunday school, and it was Moroni ten. And uh, it means really hard to read the words of Mormon and Moroni without this 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 kind of devastating sympathy for for people who were having to maintain this hope for an outcome that they knew needed to happen that they had a critical part to play in, but they lived and died not seeing the culmination of that and. Um, um, uh, there, there is, um, there are, there are all these periods in the old Testament I'm thinking about, and you will, you'll think of many others. I mean, there, there are many of them and I, I've eliminated a, a bunch from my list just because there's not time to talk about them all, but I, I'm remembering, I think it's, uh, um, in the book of Samuel, it, there's this, there's this mention that, that there had not been open vision you know, for a long period of time. Samuel was an anomaly because it was the return of open vision. It kind of felt like there was activity again in the, in the relationship between uh, God and man. And I think about the people whose lives were just before that and, uh, and including very faithful people just before that open. So I, I um, as Taylor mentioned, I'm a painter and I, uh, I, worked on a painting a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it just has the art historical uh, title. It's called Descent from the Cross, which is a typical name for uh, the paintings of Jesus being removed from the cross. And while I was painting it, um, I, I actually, I stretched that one canvas and I, I, I stretched another big, it's a large painting, it's about uh, nine by 11 feet. And I stretched another painting right next to it because I was worried that I was gonna get really depressed working on this painting and I might need to 
run over and paint some uh, resurrection or something, you know, some the, 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 the happy part of that story. But I never did get depressed working on it. I was, I was pretty horribly sad while working and found myself kind of talking to these uh, characters that I'm painting, encouraging them that it's going to turn out all right, you know, but, but what I was, uh, what I was remembering is that we read that, that we cannot read the account of the death of Jesus and the, his removal from the cross and, and his burial without knowing what's going to happen in a few days. The, the story, in a, in a sense, has been spoiled for us. It's hard for us to really fathom what is going through the minds of the apostles when their one shot is, is dead. You know, all they can do is take care of the body of their hero who gave it his best, but it, uh, it uh, ah, uh, wh what, what now? And, um, and I think that I, I know in my life, I've, I've, I've had that, been through experiences where I think, how on earth can this end well? And what would need to happen for me to ever feel happy again, you know? And, um, and I, 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 I want to talk about this, not to be depressing, but to just acknowledge and, and validate that, that that is part of this experience. I, I also want to talk about some uh, kind of solutions for dealing with that, but to, um, but to sympathize with the fact that m most of us are not at the, at the uh, exciting climactic ending of our story we're just kind of right in the middle of it. And um, so uh, one, one story from the scriptures that I think is really, uh, is really beautiful that I, I have this, um, and maybe some of you will take issue with this kind of, what, okay. Actually, if you take issue with it, I don't think you're reading the scriptures carefully, but you know, we can fight about that later. But um, there's this tendency in talking about Jesus to um, to kind of to kind of scrub up that experience like it was like like he knows your favorite flavor of ice cream you know um, and and when I read the New Testament it is not easy to be with Jesus it wasn't easy for his disciples to be with him he was at times kind of exasperated with how little they understood they were kind of they didn't they didn't exactly know what was going on he would talk about things that and they didn't get it. I mean, he obviously prophesied of his death, but he said a lot of things that they didn't fully understand. So they didn't realize that until after the events and after his resurrection. Um, but I, I'm remembering this one part, and I, and I won't read it. I mean, you can read it. It's in John 6. Um, the account is where Jesus is talking uh, fairly peculiarly, certainly for Jews at that time, about that they would need to eat his flesh and drink his blood uh, you know to for, for to, that that's what would give them and then they would never die and uh, it there's a, it says that there were many um, many of his followers that, that, that yeah they 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 couldn't they weren't gonna they, they left I, I can't remember the wording precisely right now I've been reading it all day but now it leaves him but but many didn't follow him anymore after that and there's this this is heartbreaking. <laughs> moment where Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, uh, are you going to, are you leaving too? And I, I, again, I'm paraphrasing. I mean, obviously we have it in translation. We're not sure the precise words he used, but are you, are, will you also go? And, and Peter doesn't say, no, God, we know, ex or Jesus, we know exactly what you're talking about. We're not confused or puzzled or, or, or uh, he, he doesn't say any of that. His, his answer is this, this really remarkable. He says, where, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We, we know who you are. And, and I may be filling in the too much between the lines, but I get the sense that they're saying, oh, we don't understand what you're talking about either. And it sounds really strange to us too, but we do know 
who you are. This, we, we can't depart from what we do know. And I, it, which reminded me of uh, this uh, really beautiful quote from a talk by Elder Holland a couple of years ago. Um, th this is just one quote from the, the, the address, or the, I think it was published in the Ensign 2 as under Lord, I believe. I think that was the name of the conference talk too, but where he says, in moments of fear or doubt or troubling times, hold the ground you have already won, even if that ground is limited. When those moments come and issues surface, the resolution of which is not immediately forthcoming, hold fast to what you already know and stand strong until additional knowledge comes. The size of your faith or the degree of your knowledge is not the issue. It is the integrity you demonstrate toward the faith you do have and the truth you already know. And um, uh, I, I really, I remember when he said that, and I remember really appreciating that because um, uh, in a conversation last night with some friends, uh, uh, Jeff Turley uh, mentioned that we use the term often faith crisis. And, and he was saying, you know, we really need to use a different term. Um, part of faith is that it goes through trouble. We talk about faith crisis like it's, like it's this like it's a disease or a bomb that's invading something. It's, it's, I mean, it, that would be like saying that we need to get to adulthood without going through puberty, you know, that, that, it, it, that, that cr the crises of some sorts or doubts are, are, are not to be stiff-armed. We, we sometimes puzzle and I, I'm and again, I'm paraphrasing Elder Max, well, uh, in a quote where he says uh, something along the lines of, sometimes puzzlement is the doorknob we have to firmly, firmly grow hold on to and turn to, and open the door and walk into that space in order to, to discover. And, and if we're stiff arming our doubts too much, then, then, uh, then, then we, we, can, we can never get through them or learn how to accommodate them or, or learn how to get by them. And uh, I mean, I've expanded on what he said. His comment was about grabbing the doorknob of, of being puzzled and turning it, not being afraid of that. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, in Elder Holland's uh, comments, it just, it, it, it was, it was validating for me to, to hear, it was encouraging to me to hear that, that my doubt needn't be something that I should be afraid of, um, uh, Elder, uh, Elder Hinckley, um, I think his name is David Hinckley, his uh, President Hinckley's son was a 70, and, uh, and I, I attribute this quote to him, that, um, um, that if you're building a wall and you, and you have a rock that won't fit on, in, on, in your wall that you're building, you don't tear down the wall, you know, you, you, you set it aside um, until it, you have a place where it will fit in. And and I think that I think that if we, um, I think that part of of stiff arming uh, doubt or trial or or bewilderment in our lives is is not adequately embracing a fairly significant part of discipleship. Uh, I, I'm reminded of this is a um, I'm. I'm paraphrasing a lot of people, and I'm sorry, my, my thinking is uh, fairly disorganized, I'm afraid, but it helps me in the studio. It, it's a little rough sometimes in firesides, but um, uh, Rumi, the poet Rumi, uh, talks about the, the, um, the transition between faith, from faithfulness to betrayal to trust, and um, and not all of our betrayal phases are massive or huge or, or pyrotechnic, but in little processes, you know, we, we, we learn the things we should do, we do them, but our dog dies anyway. You know, I'm thinking about when I was a little boy, that that's kind of a way that life betrays us. We think we're doing something and so God will look out for us in a certain way and that doesn't happen 
And so we can either decide that God doesn't care about me. And so he, he you know, so death intrudes anyway, or, or accident or illness or all these things, or we figure out we, we work beyond it and through it, and life will continue to throw these kinds of betrayals at us. And, and if, we, if we avoid them, ignore them, deny them, and suppress them, then I don't think we can get through them to the point where we can develop this uh, a, a more stable and sturdy trust for God. Um, the, um, there's another... Uh, uh, while I'm talking about Rumi, actually, where do I, oh, there's a, there's a poem that uh, Faith gave me. She kind of entered, well, I had read Rumi poems before, but I, uh, it was uh, since knowing Faith that I've uh, come to love his work so much more and to be influenced in my discipleship by, uh, by really amazing concepts that he articulates so beautifully. And there's a poem I'm going to read to you. Uh, it, it, you would probably uh, do well to go to YouTube and see, hear Coleman Barks. Uh, this is his translation uh, and hear him recite it with uh, music. It's remarkable, but I'm just going to read it for you. But I think this illustrates a really important part, a uh, way of dealing with, with uh, the time in which our stories don't, uh, our, our loose ends don't tie up. One night, a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with praising until a cynic said, so I've heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer to that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Hitter, the guide of souls in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I've never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Uh, that's the poem Love Dogs by Rumi. And I think that one of the, one of the things that has been so uh, influential and effective in my life about this poem is rather than see the, my periods of longing as things to be gotten over that it has helped me to, as, to assimilate, to, uh, to actually find ways to have God join me in that, in that doubt or join me in that longing, join me in that, in that thing that is not satisfied. And it becomes a part of my discipleship rather than this thing that I just got to gut out until it ends because some of them don't end soon and some of them don't end, you know, some of them don't end in this life. And um, I'm also a dog person. I love dogs. And, uh, and, uh, and it, it has helped me to, um, in my conversations with God, in my expectations of what will happen in my prayers, it, it's changed that that to be able to, to sit with the, to sit with the longing better. I, I, I can hardly say I'm good at this. I mean, I'm w working it out, but to sit with the longing and let that be a part of the connection. I really feel like that, I mean, I'll tell you to, to talk about fairly personal matters that there's a revelation I've had many times and, um, uh, and it is, uh, it is essentially God, uh, essentially saying, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. Um, I, it's not a language, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an interior. I mean, by that, I mean, it's not, it, it's not a, a voice that I hear. 
but in, when I'm asking something and the, the answer is, you know, essentially, uh, and this is me kind of stretching the thought bubble out into more things that we're going to work on you becoming someone who can know that because you really should and need to. Uh, but but I, I can't just, I can't give you a partial answer right now and it wouldn't make sense to you right now. So we're gonna work on you becoming someone who can know that. Um, uh, and another, one of the most common uh, revelations, and when I say this, it's, I'm not saying that every, you know, every other day I get this revelation. I mean, kind of pure messages coming from God, I, I would even say in my life are, are somewhat rare, but, but one of the most common ones is him saying, I love you, I, you know, and sometimes that's in the context of me saying, what, what do I do here? Because I, I need some very specific instructions with a very specific difficulty. And this would be a great time for some very specific instruction. And the answer is, I love you, Brian. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and uh, and I, I mean, I remember times when I'm saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, feeling that come over me and saying, yeah, you know, thank you. I know it's wonderful. I love you too. But what do we do? You know, and again, the feeling, I love you. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll write it down. God loves Brian. Brian loves underline, underline God. Okay. That's good. We've got that. So, but I just need instruction here. And, um, and again, just the answer was, I love you. And realizing that that was the answer I was getting, that my question needed some adjustment. Uh, and that however I proceeded, however I succeeded or, or failed, that I needed to make sure that I did not interrupt that the most important message was that God loves me, that he loves the people involved in this, and I must do nothing to interfere with everyone understanding that important, retaining, if they can, that, imp that most important thing. And I proceeded and succeeded and failed in, you know, varying degrees. But um, uh, he, didn't, he didn't solve it for me. And I didn't come through it feeling betrayed. I didn't come through it feeling uh, abandoned. Um, uh, I did, there, 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 there was some of the dog whining for its master, but uh, kind of working that in and, and not feeling like the fact that I wasn't getting the answer that I, that as far as I could tell, this was a really great time for a revelation um, or the kind of revelation that I and felt like should happen. That, 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 the, that the yearning and longing, even in the absence of that satisfying conclusion, uh, has become a part of my discipleship. I'm grateful for that. Um, I re, I re, there's a uh, kind of what's happened to me as I have in my life deepened my trust with God, notwithstanding certain betrayals of life and experience is a, a good friend of mine, uh, Steve Vistanet. Uh, I think he we were talking about a, a talk he'd given in sacrament meeting and, and we were talking about trusting God. And, uh, and Steve, uh, I, I really love this. Uh, he said, he said I, I'm not so much worried about whether or not I can trust God as I am about whether or not God can trust me. You know? And I think that that is a beautiful thing that he could get to that point in his life. And I, I aspire to that too that my trust in the Lord is solid enough that I, I spend more time seeing to it that God can depend on me to behave in certain ways and to, and to respond in certain ways. And uh, anyway, I appreciate Steve's uh, comment there. I, um, and at the end of my, of my uh, comments, I would like to read um, uh, some lyrics actually that my, uh, why faith has written and um, and uh, you, and she said that she is willing you can email her at um, at faith email at yahoo.com she still has a yahoo email and uh, to get permission if you are interested in utilizing these uh, um, uh, to, to, uh, lyrics that are 
that are protected. But it, we, we love the song, Oh, How a Lowe's, a Rose, Low How a Rose. And, um, and always feel like it ends too soon, you know, and, and we, we researched and found a couple of other verses. But um, sadly, the additional verses uh, abandoned the, the last line that is such a beautiful tie between the two verses that we generally sing about when half spent was the night. And, um, and so uh, Faith, as she's been working on this actually for some time and even uh, adjusting them, adjusting the lyrics slightly as I was, as I was asking you to print them for me tonight. But, uh, but they, they kind of, um, the, the coming of Jesus was at an unexpected hour. And, uh, and, and I feel like the, these, these lines uh, it, uh, illuminate some of that. So this, for verse, this, I'm just gonna start with verse three and four. The, fir the first two verses are the common one sung. O oh, perilous the hour when our sweet hope was born. Through human form, God's flower cleft earth with wood and thorn and cured the hoary blight with suckering might redeemed us when half spent was the night. Beauty, beauty redolent heals us though buried was the seed. This holy rose twice bloomed, true sacred was the deed. Impossible the sight, from sin and death he saved us when half spent was the night. And then repeats, from sin and death he saves us when half spent is our night. And um, I mean, the, the, the message that I, would, that I would want to leave is that, uh, that the hope that Moroni talks about in, his, in several places in the Book of Mormon and, and that Paul talks about, and many prophets talk about, that the hope is, is, is hard won. It's not a passive thing. That to maintain hope and faith and to have charity, take, take work and patience, and patience is sadly not cheaply bought. And that if we can, if we can bind our yearning to our discipleship, that I, I, I feel in my experience that that, is, that has helped me weather those difficulties uh, feeling like I am connected to my God and I'm thankful for Jesus and thankful at this season and all seasons that he came impossibly he came he came here he came into one of these to save our necks you know and and when I read the New Testament I don't expect him to always be polite to his apostles to really believe that he that he he has done well, actually, the Doctrine and Covenant suggests that he has overcome and will yet overcome all things. He's still doing the work that we will need to be brought in. And I thank him for it. And I bear testimony of him. I love the Lord. And I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, lovely, lovely uh, thoughts uh, on, on this uh sacred on this uh, sacred season here as we, as we contemplate the waiting um let's uh uh turn it over we we mentioned that we will have some opportunity for some uh questions and discussion here from from those who are um uh watching this uh if you want to put a comment in the chat bubble down at the bottom of your zoom screen we are uh opening and listening to those uh, but I'll also let uh, others who are our panelists here, uh, uh, Rebecca and, and Christian and, and uh, Sharon and Edgy, if, uh, if anybody wants to kind of jump in to maybe kick, kick us off a little bit as we uh, await some, uh, some of our audience. Yeah, so I'll bring in a comment from Facebook. Someone um, talks about definition of crisis and had the, I think the Greek on here, um, that, that crisis, and I think Brian's really beautifully got us to, to, to rethink this, um, but this definition 
talks about crisis as a decision, a judgment. Uh, and so I'm, uh, you know, thinking about this notion of puzzlement and um, and and not stiff army, <laughs> right? Um, I'm wondering if that kind of definition of crisis helps us to approach um, this in a different way. Yeah, I love that. I I was I was unaware of that, and it, it sounds like the original Greek is uh, is more in keeping what uh, with what Jeff was hoping. Uh, we could call a, a crisis that the the word for us kind of means oh my gosh you know someone has jumped off the boat um, uh, but it, it sounds like yeah a crisis is kind of a decision point and uh, and um, and we should be better at not only not being afraid of our own but not being afraid of those having such experiences around us that, that, that uh, our fear of them can do more damage to one's faith or our own faith than, uh, than embracing and working through and working with and accommodating sometimes for a long period of time, difficulties we might have. That that can be done and be faithful and believing at the same time. It's, it's I, 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 my testimony is that that can be. Yeah, and I loved um, bringing in Rumi and thinking about the transition um, and faith as a process that it's about faithfulness, betrayal, trust in this, and it's building that it doesn't take us in a different direction, <laughs> right? Well, um, you know, the, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I, di I in no way meant to uh, trivialize um, Betrayal. I, I when I mentioned, you know, my dog still died. I, I mean, that was an early, you know, I, I I I said that because that was an early experience of life betraying me, you know, and and obviously not the not the worst one ever, but it was a, an early one, and for a for a, a child, that's that's a significant blow, you know. So in my case, one of my first experiences with death with death, you know, of a loved one. And, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, I, I think that, uh, did I misquote Rumi there, faith? Faithfulness, then betrayal, then trust, yeah. One way that I do I, miss- I really- Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I really like your reframing of the, of God being in the longing, of the answer being I love you. Um, the crisis, I call, well, maybe we're trying to avoid that word, but- No, we can use it. The, the crisis often has the feeling of now or never. It's someone dying or the dog died. Um, it is, I'm, deciding about a marriage. It's, um, it is, I am about to jump off the cliff. I, it is, and, and that sense that you describe beautifully of, of, this is really a good time for an answer. This is really, and, and uh, we, we need a way to think about those experiences because those are the hard times when it feels like, uh, And when, and, and how do we, but life goes on or life doesn't go on. And uh, that's, uh, that's something you have, you've talked about. That's how, that's when, that's, that's what crisis has come to mean for a lot of us. Yeah. Well, there's this, um, that th this is again from the Sunday school uh, class today. Um, Chris, a member of the class commented on we, we were looking for a period of time at those, you know, what is it, uh, uh, Moroni 10, three through five, it's the, you know, the promise about the Book of Mormon. And, and she uh, uh, was just pointing out the English that, um, that in that, in that 
verse, he says, ponder it. And I have always read it as ponder it, meaning ponder the Book of Mormon that I've been reading. And that's not what the sentence says. Um, Moroni says, first of all, uh, that we should remember the great mercy that God has had upon the children of men from the time of Adam, even down into the time that you received these things and ponder it in your heart that, that, that we have to make an active effort and it's hard and it's particularly hard when life is hard. But we, but, but he, I think the invitation is that to kind of try to wedge a little crack in that door between us and the, and the heavens, we need to remember God's mercy. And, and sometimes um, a disciple of Jesus or not, we kind of lose sight of that. And, uh, and certainly when we're in crisis, that's often because we're kind of losing sight of that. But, um, but yeah, the mercy of God is apparently a very, very important part, uh, 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 pondering on the mercies of God. It has this uh, important, it plays this important role that I haven't, I, I mean, it just was pointed out to me today. I mean, I've read that scripture 10,000 times and it was pointed out to me today, the connection between ponder, it means ponder the mercies of God on the children of men. So sometimes we feel like it's not a very merciful time, but. We have a few questions coming in uh, from the chat. Uh, one from our uh, beloved Jody England Hanson. Let me read this one to you and, and you can respond. It's about connecting your work to some of the themes that you've been discussing today. Have you Thank ever you. thought of an, have you ever thought of an image of Christ, one that might come to you when you consider a painting, but it is so different from anything that you had considered before? or so different from what might be acceptable even to your own broad experience that it is hard for you to hold on to or consider moving forward with in creating? Um, the, uh, that, yes, <laughs> I, I, maybe I should, I, I have, I have, I consider uh, often I suppose I, I consider often painting Jesus, but I tend to do so um, thinking more uh, mythologically about redemption. So it's not it's 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 about it's it um, a bearded uh, man in a robe is not necessarily uh, in the painting, but it is examining some aspect of giving and receiving or. Or, or being redeemable or, or, or reaching for something that we can't understand. Or, um, I think that um, I, I consider my paintings to be very religious, even though the subject matters are not usually uh, overtly so. Obviously, Descent from the Cross is, you know, that's just a, a, an imagining of an event from from the scriptures. Uh, I, I mean, I, I have a painting uh, that maybe some of you have seen that was in the church show a couple of years ago called Jesus and the Angry Babies, um, which, is, uh, which is extra textual as you know, those of you who are familiar with the New Testament. But, uh, yeah, but if you're familiar with babies, then uh, I, I actually, I mentioned Steve Vistonet earlier. He and I draw together to kind of, mostly to kind of make each other laugh. And, and I drew that picture first to make Steve laugh because Jesus is always pictured as, you know, having these cherubic well-behaved infants on his lap. And, and my feeling, and when I, and when I was drawing with Steve, I thought I've had children. Uh, they weren't all well-behaved. They weren't even all happy about it. Sometimes this was mom's idea, you know, and, uh, um, and, and so I, I did this drawing and Steve of course laughed and the, but the more I thought about it was, this was a much better metaphor of, of our relationship to Jesus when we are usually not that well behaved and not uh, and uh, and and not getting along and don't understand everything that's happening around us. I think that one of the beautiful things about having children is is to kind of throw a wrench into the mix of the order of our lives that is much more in keeping with some eternal <laughs> truth. You know that 
that it is that 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 unruliness is 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 kind of a part of the whole gig and and as much as we would hope that everyone would behave even with the best of intentions uh we we don't always get it right and don't always do it right and yet there's this persist persistent sense of of jesus's love and care and concern and reaching for us with his redemption and his hoping i believe that we will reach back it's it's not prayer is not always an exchange of data you know it's sometimes it's just reaching and occasionally occasionally i mean i think the reaching back is maybe maybe even always there but occasionally we we feel it and that's good and it has to last us for a while sometimes i it's i think it's important to remember that as i understand the covenant made in the sacrament virtually every week is is a remember you know is god, god thing remember and you may disagree and feel like i'm reading too much into this but if if jesus is or if god is saying is wanting us to covenant to remember then the assumption is that our lives will be such that it will be kind of hard to do that we'll need constant reminders it, there will be that, that, that there will be an absence that we have to fill just with remembering him, that we will have to reach for something that's not always there. I, I, again, maybe you disagree with what that word implies, but, um, but uh, I mean, all that, uh, all that, I mean, I'll obviously keep his commandments and, and covenant that to, you know, to, to take his name upon us, but remember him. And then there's this, promise of a, of the spirit that'll help us kind of sort out the the messy parts of us of our of that is life that is that is just bewildering and puzzling and ah so brian maybe the answer will be do what jesus would do but the question is the question is how would you have other how would you have yourself or other people treat us when we are in the longing, the crisis, the questioning uh, part of our existence, how should we be treating others, viewing, talking, treating others who are in that part of their experience? Um, I mean, there, there isn't, uh, you know, I mean, the answer, do what Jesus would do is pretty hard. I, I, I love that we say that all the time. I mean, I, it's hard to know what Jesus would do. He was always kind of turning things on their head and behaving in ways that people didn't anticipate. You know, I think it would be difficult to know. However, what occurs to me, and, and I, I learned this from uh, uh, a conversation I had uh, with Spencer Fluman, um, where he... Um, he was with someone who was who was who was really struggling, and his response that, that I just thought I, I just th this this kind of changed a lot of things for me, and I hope it addresses what you're saying, Christian. But he, his response was, you know, I I I don't know what to tell you to do, but but you are mourning, and my obligation as a disciple is to mourn with those that mourn. Uh, there's a scripture I was looking for, and maybe somebody can help me find it. I couldn't find it. Uh, I think I just need to get a word search for the Doctrine and Covenants. But it, it was a, um, it, it was I, in my recollection, and maybe it was a dream and it doesn't exist, but in my recollection, it's kind of a list of, of um, uh, describing service. It was a scripture that was a, being applied to uh, home teaching at the time. This was years ago. And it just said, be with, was just be between two commas and be with, be with and da, 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 da. And we focused on all the other listable things, but, but I think a really, I think those two words are really huge and difficult and unscripted, you know, that, um, that as, as much as we can, we, we be with that we, that, that, that it, it is often not too hard of a stretch to realize why someone would be having a, a, a difficulty. We often kind of want to rush in with an answer or, to, or, you know, to solve the problem. Oh no, this is a description. 
and very often those are very often those are just simply wrong or they don't address the 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 fear or concern um but i i think that uh I, I think maybe the thing that we should do that that I feel like is Jesus would do is be with and 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 love and and people must have their own journey uh, that that's kind of the horrible inconvenience of the whole agency thing you know but 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 if if I love you and you're my friend and you're having this problem you know make sure that I don't give you the impression that I'm having to distance myself from you and that I will hear you, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. I, uh, I I'm, love I'm that. Just, again. <laughs> what's that? It's just such a beautiful answer. It's just oh. what, what I want. So I just, I'm reacting to that. Be well, there's, a, there's this yes. terrible, and it might not be in the Dark and Covenants, but it's still really important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here there, we have. Well, and I'm thinking again about Jesus and the angry babies and folks have said that that's a favorite and it's, and it's one of mine um, as well. And Jesus has the angry babies there on his lap, right? Right. <laughs> and I often feel like, I think we all often feel like the angry baby and, um, and, and I think it fits well with this idea of, um, you know, often, so often not being at the end, at the climax of something, but instead at this point where we're in this thing that is not satisfied. And sometimes we don't exactly know what we want, like the angry baby or yeah. whatever, right? So, yeah. Well, there's this kind of haunting scripture um, that is uh, that that I passed over many many times in the New Testament. It's in John again, and and um, and, and it, Jesus is saying he will send a his, he will send a comforter. And because he says he's sending a comforter, I just pass over him saying I will not leave you comfortless because I I'm assuming that's like saying I'm going to send a comforter so you won't be comfortless and goes on you know. But comfortless is translated from a completely different kind of word than comforter. And it's, it's simply orphan. I will not leave you orphans. And, and kind of the, the it, hopefully I'm not, again, not reading too much into this, but there's a dark side to that phrase, which is in my mind, you are going to feel orphaned sometimes and i just need you to remember you know like oh that heartbreaking scripture in isaiah i've, I've carved you in the palms of my hands you know um i and and you know maybe, maybe that's maybe that's kind of cold comfort when we don't feel connected to the lord but but i i feel like he acknowledges in that scripture to me talking to his to the 12 you know that he's saying you're going to feel abandoned you're gonna you know you're gonna feel orphaned i won't leave you orphans i will come to you he says which which to me that the 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 other side of that sentence is there will be times when you're gonna wonder what you know so. It, it's, I'll just say something that is brought up for me. It seems like the idea of um, the question of orphans, the question of longing, and then the, the conversation you talked about with Spencer Fluman about mourning all seem to be modes of intimacy that we are reluctant to develop. <laughs> and, um, and yet also precisely what we're looking for. And, and it seems like that... I, 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 I'm doing that terrible academic thing where I don't have a question as much of a comment, but, um, but I'm thinking about your work and how much of it reflects a sort of often quotidian intimacy. Um, and if, if that is, you're thinking of as a sort of metaphoric or mythological representation of, of Jesus, I, I don't know, that, that's recasting it for me in a way it's really, really beautiful. So. Oh, good. I hope so. I think I'm better at it in painting than I am in my house. 
uh, but uh, but I, I feel like I, I mean I feel like in painting that I kind of stumble into those that, that that I've kind of learned a certain way of of approaching work where where I uh, uh, I I I I don't I don't have there are certain boundaries that I'm able to just kind of open up at the studio and I'm trying to I'm trying to do that more in other parts of my life too, because I think it is important. I, I kind of accidentally stumble into it in the studio. The thing about a painting too, is if you mess it up, eh, no one knows, you know, you paint over it. Uh, family members, uh, not so much, you know. <laughs> Friends, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing. It's a, we're in a hard thing and um, but but I, I feel like we, the the hope that we are that we are challenged to develop that it, that it is that it is achievable. Um, I think it's interesting in the Elder Holland quote that he's that he says you know even if it's a even if it's a little a little territory that you where that you do have don't don't lose sight or hold of that that part. Don't let the other things get way ahead of it, so that just gets kind of buried in the exhaust fumes, you know. And uh, I, I think that I thought was that was a very uh, a, a wonderfully astute, yeah, like many uh, brilliant things. When I hear them, I think, well, that is so obvious. Oh, oh my gosh! We have found it. No, no, mom had it. Oh, the oh. ENC twenty fifty three. What does it say? The teacher's duty is to watch over the church always and be with. And the, the teacher's duty is to watch over this church always and be with and strengthen. And strengthen. Ah, that was my mother-in-law. Yeah. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> I've looked we for have, that. We hour. have a number of comments. <laughs> What's we that? Have, we have a number of comments. We have a number of comments also telling us at DNC twenty. Verse 53, but also that the words be with or be with them are in our sacrament prayers. Yeah. Um, and the and the idea, the idea, but not the words, is there in the in the charge at the waters of Mormon about mourning with those yeah. that mourn. I, I think I think we should get t-shirts that say be with. <laughs> it's it's part of my um, my the testimony that I have of the importance of lunch, that lunch is a great time to be with people. I love to. I mean, restaurants are a little problematic at the moment, but I, I that that's a that's something I miss a great deal. An aspect of being with be with with good food is probably how I would say that. I'm wondering a little about how we be with or allow ourselves to be with God. Um, in these moments of dissatisfaction. So how do we have, how do we allow God to join us in that thing that is not satisfied? How do we sit better with the longing that we have? Yeah, um, uh, the, I mean, the, a scripture that, um, that I actually have written down that I didn't mention, but is, it, this, is, this, is, um, this isn't a happy answer, Rebecca. Hopefully we can come up with something. But but for many, this was their experience. I'm, I'm reading Hebrews 11, 13, talking about Abraham and Sarah and, um, and others. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. <laughs> this is so heartbreaking. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I mean, it's kind of a haunting scripture, Hebrews uh, eleven thirteen. 13. Um, that it, I suppose that one thing, I, one thing that occurs to me is that this terrible, uh, maybe, anyway, I'll, I'll say it, this terrible desire and need we have for union I think to a large extent is not our lot here, you know, that, that, that some of the code books that Lucifer made off with, you know, that, that, that communications were, are down, that, 
that that things are things are messed up and um uh and so so the 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 feeling of that longing is uh is not the exception i think in my own experience i have felt when i was in doubt or um or um or, 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 you know, longing for something that I felt was absolutely necessary that wasn't happening, that, 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 I, that was me and most people were just perfectly happy, you know, but, uh, but I, I've come to realize, no, that's just not, that's just not true. Um, and so I would say, you know, I have no authority in this matter. I would say lunch is a very important thing that we ha- that if we can find people with whom we can talk about these things in, in a way that doesn't feel like it, it's tearing it apart, but, but kind of acknowledging it. And even ideally ways that it feels like God can be brought into that experience. Um, I, um, I often have thought that, um, yeah, you know, in, in giving uh, blessings, that I, you know, I mean, I, I, I generally have grown up thinking blessings are to heal people, you know, and, um, and I, I feel now like obviously that takes place sometimes, but not always. And that the purpose of blessings is to just bring God into that pain because he needs to be there too. And so, um, I mean, um, yeah, I don't know how to say that any clearer, but, but um, you know, the pressure is not upon me to get some open vision to tell somebody that this is all going away, you know? I mean, it's, versions of that have happened where there have been remarkable recoveries, but I feel like God in, in, in asking his children to, to bless each other, that he's saying, yeah, you're hurting. Bring, bring me along. Bring, uh, I, I, that's where I want to be too. I want to be with this process. And um, I, 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 so anyway, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, Rebecca, but I think that, I think that um, if we can learn how the reaching, uh, well, the, uh, let me, let me mention that in my own reaching, there's a kind of claustrophobia that comes, you know, a, a drastic feeling of, I've got to know this or else I'm going to explode. That takes a long time to get over. I mean, you can't do anything in that, in a panic, you know, but, to, but for me to kind of breathe through the panic and calm down and read Rumi's poetry and, you know, read the scriptures and, and, um, and kind of find these, these ways that, say oh you, you you get a sense every once in a while that uh, you do you do understand how much this hurts and how badly i feel like i need to know this and how badly i need to understand why this isn't happening and how badly you know i think i think that ah that was a non-answer sorry <laughs> uh, brian you you started us out with a pretty powerful image, at least for me, that was of the apostles, the disciples around Jesus being bewildered in that last week. Um, and, and it occurs to me that they never did get an answer in so many words. I, 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 the, I mean, the answer may be the experience. It may be, uh, it may be that they spent 50 years after figuring it out. But it occurs to me that that there never was a uh, now I'm going to explain it to you kind of yeah <laughs> well I I think about the the um, the moment that I mentioned where Peter you know says where would we go you know you have the words of eternal life um, we know you're we know that you're the son of God you know there's uh, and then I I'm kind of paraphrasing him saying essentially we don't know what you're talking about here either but but we know who you are. But Jesus's response to him is not comfort. It's not comfort. You know, his response is, 
one of you is a devil. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I've called 12 apostles and one of you is going to betray me. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, um, yeah, he, he doesn't, he doesn't tie it up for the neat bows. And, and so I, I think that there are these, there are these oases that God extends to us. I think Moroni is describing one of them in, uh, in Moroni 10, three through five, uh, kind of setting up a, a, a number, a sequence that if you go through this, then this is one of the oases that you can hold on to. I think that, I think Rumi is kind of describing one of those oases. If you can learn how to, how to merge your longing with, with a feeling of connection to God, even though he's not answering your question, then, then that is that is a tether, you know, to so you so we can survive this, because it's hard to survive it, you know. We, well, one of the ways to survive it is go, ma, 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 you know. That is, and I don't know that that's a. I think I've used that sometimes, you know, but but um, but it. I I think God appreciates when we want to take Him with us into our pain and our illness and our death. I think that uh, I, I feel like that's not, I mean, that's easily said and not easily done, but, but I feel like discipleship is, yeah, take him, take him along on all of those, all of those. I think we uh, are, are nearing the end here. If there's maybe one other comment or, or, or question before we wrap things up. I've got one, uh, and maybe maybe we'll we'll end with me. I guess I'll I'll take that privilege. Um, I, I've been thinking a little bit. Uh, many of us on this uh, on on the panelists here are are academics. Um, there may be a similar experience uh, of an artist, but sometimes the projects that we are working on uh, require a lot of patience. Years in some cases that we are laboring away at at our research, at our writing, at honing our ideas, at getting our ideas shot down with our friends, and then we before we dare to take them to a broader audience, you know, uh, and painfulness, uh, betrayal, and then <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and uh, and there's a kind of slowness and deliberation that can sometimes feel very frustrating. Uh, because we feel like we have good ideas, we want to get them out there, we want to get people to, to, to see what we've got to say, um, or we think we finally have solved whatever problem it is that we're working on. Uh, and then we have to go through the whole publishing process, which takes a whole other, you know, <laughs> years and years sometimes. Um, so uh, I, I, it seems to be sort of a metaphor a little bit of the kind of the waiting, the the longing, the the impatience, maybe that we sometimes face in in, in our own work, uh, of that maybe lifelong delay that we yeah. experience spiritually sometimes too. And I, I wonder if you think about that in your own work, or if you have any any reactions to that. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the advantages um, uh, to my line of work, as opposed to a scholar, is is um, a painting is just a sentence, you know, it's not, it's not even an essay, you know? And so, so I am able to kind of bring, I mean, the, the arc of my, of my uh, life work is, uh, I mean, well, I'll be working on it till I'm dead, you know, and hopefully it will be significant enough that other people will take it from there. But, um, but I, uh, I do, um, I, 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 one thing that occurred to me, Taylor, when you were saying that is, uh, there's this, there's this aspect of being an artist that, that may, um, that, that may overlap what you're saying that, that people generally don't want to hear about. And that is that I can do it because I am not undone by fairly devastating disappointment on a fairly regular basis, both of my own failings. Um, uh, in working on a painting early on, I have this sense of what I want it to do and it really doesn't accomplish that. And what it, what happens is, is good and useful and pur purposeful. I'm the only one mourning the one that got away. You know, no one else even sees it. And if I'm crying to someone at a show opening uh, because the painting they bought is not the one that I wanted it to be, you know, that, that 
that doesn't work very well. So, um, but but I I think that I I think that uh, in both instances and maybe in all instances of of any creative endeavor, and I include discipleship as a very creative endeavor, that we have to learn to accommodate uh, disappointment and delays because. I mean, people's notion of what it is to be a writer or a scholar or a painter is very different than the actual uh, kind of ugly nuts and bolts that you're describing, you know. And um, and so by the time they witness the, you know, the epic success, I'm kind of done. <laughs> I'm tired of it. I don't want to talk about it anymore, you know. And um, so anyway, it's uh, but but I think that discipleship is like that, too that with full of good intentions, full of hopes, the thing we want to have happen doesn't happen, but this opens up. And if we're so focused on what isn't gonna happen and miss that, then that's a problem. And, 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 and we have to be able to think on our feet and we have to not be undone by disappointment because there will be disappointment. And we have to, um, uh, anyway, I, I, so maybe that is a bit of an, of an overlap, but uh, you know, it's it's a it's a slog. We, we, and there's enough joy in it that we stick with it, you know. But uh, but it's not all the fun part. On fun part in any in any life, I think that's kind of the, that's kind of the case. Brian, thank you so much for sharing your uh, testimony with us tonight, for uh, sharing your experiences, and for giving us your time and your talents, really, to uh, to think through these issues with us. Uh, I also want to thank all of our panelists for uh, for being here, for spending their time and, and going through the chat and, and raising some great questions for our discussion, as well as Edgy and Sharon for their uh, for their prayers and participation. Uh, Sharon is going to have our uh, benediction, as we mentioned at the at the outset, and then we'll close from there. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Our Father in heaven. We're grateful that we can uh, meet tonight. We're grateful for the technology that allows us to meet from so many different places and that we can learn together and learn from Brian and think more about what it is to be a disciple. We're grateful for the opportunity to reflect on uh, delays and disappointments in Advent season and uh, with this longest night of the year, knowing that there are ways that we can find comfort from the please help us to feel that comfort please help us to be better attuned to providing that comfort for others um, help us to have a christmas that uh helps helps us remember the and then we ask a blessing on so many who are in need and that we'll be able to see what we can do in our own individual spheres to address those needs uh, again we love thee we're grateful for um for the gospel, for our savior, and for the variety of gifts and ways that we can know him better. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sharon.